Okay, can you can you for the sake of the podcast tell us your name and your your position or your uh, interest? Um, Pat Gonzalez Rogers. I am currently at the Yale School of Environment, where I am a um, professor of practice and a lecturer. Um, I talk about um, and and speak about issues related to tribal sovereignty and natural resources, as well as cultural and sacred sites there. Um, and so, um, you know, by and large, my my interests are really um, they're not relegated, but they're primarily um, within native and indigenous communities. Um, I I always clarify for people, um, I am not Native American. I am um, um, Native or indigenous on my mom's side, both um, Samoan as well as Tagalog, which are the indigenous Filipinos to the Philippines. And so um, that is where I, I grew up within those particular cultural kinds of precepts. Um, and so that has really advanced um, most of my career. I would say probably is about 80, 85% of the things I've done in my professional life have been related to native issues um, and to a certain extent, the greater BIPOC community. Um, I came to um, the Bears years um, as their inaugural executive director. Um, they had a a national search and I was kind of identified and then selected to be um, the executive director. I had been previously right before that the senior native advisor at the Environmental Protection Agency, a job that is similar to other jobs I've had. I've, I've been the senior native advisor for three different federal agencies, um, including the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service and the Department of Health and Human Services. Um, and so, you know, I, I came to the Bears years after it was um, designated by um, President Obama, but after it had been then been reduced about exactly a year later by President Trump by 85%. Um, and so this was a really interesting time because I came on it when it had a designation, but it was certainly going through a political kind of review of the Trump administration in terms of a, you know, what would fairly call a profound reduction. Um, and so I entered the picture right at um, when that reduction occurred. Um, and so, I was hired um, with three kind of major things to accomplish. One, um, could we restore the monument to its previous and original size? I'll say contextually, what people don't realize is the tribes originally wanted 2 million acres. Um, um, President Obama then decided on an amount a little under 1.4 million acres. So that was the first thing. They wanted it to be restored. Two, they wanted um, um, the organization to create a comprehensive land management plan that was thoroughly native and had it its underpinnings, traditional knowledge married with what I would call traditional science. Um, and the third thing was to formalize that the tribes would be recognized um, by the land management agencies, i.e. the Bureau of Land Management and the U.S. Forest Service as the um, co-managers of the National Monument. Um, I will say from the work of, by the work of the tribes and the staff, we accomplished all three of those goals. Um, and so, um, it was, you know, in my eyes, in terms of the the kind of deliverables and the metrics that we set for ourselves, a very successful endeavor. Now, juxtaposed against that, and I'm, I'm, what I want to do is kind of really give a background on what the the extraction interest um, were, and and this was um, can be, you know looked up and researched through both the Washington Post, the political, and I think um, roll call. 
Energy Fuels Inc., a Canadian-based company, had a direct interface with the Trump administration. Um, records showed that they had met directly with the Interior Secretary, um, and by all accounts, they delineated the reduction of boundaries. Now consider this, a Canadian-based company that, does in, that deals in uranium um, went in and Trump and I don't know this for a fact because Trump is an uh, an ideologue. I, I'm not sure how nuanced he is with, with respect to the bear's ears, but it is the ultimate um, slap in the face to a former president to say, I will reduce it. And I will then uh, make the rationale because it is public lands that this um, is best served that we give 85% of this incredibly singular rare kind of landscape, basically for extraction purposes. Now one has to realize um, there is not oil and gas on that particular platform, if you will. Um, mm -hmm. What there is, is uranium um, deposits. Um, and just by a bit of history, we all know there's a horrible history involved with this. Um, Navajo Nation, um, 40, 50 years prior, um, when there was not a lot of regulation and oversight, but 133 of the 150 Navajo workers died because of direct kinds of um, either implications or the after effects of uranium mining. So um, there is that history. And that is how um, the extraction industry became very kind of involved um, in the reduction of the bear's ears. And they will say this despite saying we support the bear's ears, and then also kind of in a way really misguiding the public. Um, it, for all of those that are very kind of educated and aware of how um, sovereignty goes, the expression of a tribal nation can only be done by elected officials. And what they did is select selected um, members of a Navajo nation of a particular chapter, right? Um, and then use them to say Navajo nation supports extraction. And what they really did is just picked a couple of individual people that were supportive. The governance of Navajo Nation was never supportive. It is a huge distinction. Think about it in this way. It is as if a PTA member in Sacramento said the state of California says A, B, and C. Um, and it's very distinct. And so while that person is certainly um, um, has a position to express it is an individual expression. It is not an expression or an endorsement by the governance or the sovereignty of the Navajo Nation. So I, I kind of want to paint a very clear. Well, picture. yeah, and it's the old trick too. You get you get one friendly native to put his X on a piece of paper, and all of a sudden, you know, large uh, amounts of land are transferred. It happened all over the West since about 1850. Yeah, and so. Um, this company, Energy Fuels Inc., um, which is one of the primary uranium extractors in the U.S. Now, what people have to know also about uranium, and I, I'm trying to create a factual as well as fair picture. Uranium in the U.S. is of a low grade, and it's much more expensive in the, in the other um, countries that you can procure it, Australia. Canada, um, I think Kazakhstan is the other, as well as formerly the Ukraine. Um, and, and in fact, our price point within the US is not competitive. It is almost 40 to 50% cheaper outside of the US. Um, and so there was, um, so people know this, right at the end of the Trump administration, there was a bailout um, of about a billion five to uranium for national security interests, um, which tells me a couple of things. This company couldn't stand on its two feet and is not tethered to the, you know, the free market principles. They needed a federal bailout. 
And the thing that they did immediately was do a stock buyback of their own stocks. Now they say that um, it was so that they could uh, advance um, forward and do more extraction. That could potentially be true. I also know this, when you do a, a, a stock purchase of your own, executives are the ones who um, monetarily benefit the most. So there's a lot of dealing behind the scenes. Um, and in the reality of it is um, only about 1% of uranium could be extracted out of the Bears Ears or even in the area now of the, the, the new National Monument um, by the Grand Canyon. So these are um, advanced as ideological ideas, but the reality is when you look at the facts, it, it's quite diluted and watered down. Um, and in fact, we had at the Bears Ears, we had probably one of the most preeminent environmental economists. He capitates activities and then gives you what the, the, the dollar worth of it. He actually looked at the activities of extraction um, in the Bears Ears. Um, his, his name is um, Bob Mendelston. He's an environmental economist um, and, and said, it has very little worth. Now you have to realize the whole kind of rhetoric that was given through the Trump administration is twofold. One, local economies will thrive because of this extraction activity, um, and we will secure um, a rare element um, in terms of our energy, you know, kind of efficiency, um, which might have a little bit, but the first point is incredibly fallacious. Um, the fact is, um, what we know is all regional economies are really advanced through property tax. Um, that is how um, the region reserves or um, gets a revenue and then it supports activities. Well, a company like Energy Fuel Inc., they're leasing lands. They pay no property tax. Um, and the jobs that there would really be derived are of a um, only several dozen jobs actually. And um, because it's very specialized, the jobs that go to locals tend to be custodial. They tend to be transportation, trucking things here and there. Um, and they're, they're not sustainable. At some point they end. What we do know about national monuments are, um, and there's been a 40, 50 year study of all national mon monuments in the last 50 years. All of them have been, increased exponentially economically post-national monument status. And the jobs are not in the dozens or in the hundreds. They're in the thousands that they create um, in the local regional economy. And so if you're actually going to advance that point, let's really speak in fact, because national monuments um, in, in many ways first provide a protection on cultural resources and natural resources, but they advance the economy in a fairly profound way. So um, a, there's a lot of kind of debate there going on from a political kind of spectrum. Mm -hmm. Well, it seems like we can introduce a number of other sites into the conversation because of what you said. You know, there's gold mining at Oro Cruz in Arizona that Preston Arrowweed uh, explained uh, from his Quetzon perspective. And that's a Canadian company run by Russian uh, staff, CEO. Then we have Packer Pass, lithium extraction, the traditional way, dig it up, dig it all up, up there. And that's a traditional landscape and um, massacre site two massacres and a village site. And um, and then we have some lithium uh, extraction via geothermal going on uh, down in uh, Imperial Valley, California. So it seems like the pressure is on from, from mining in areas that tribes consider uh, sacred. And it seems like all the T's aren't crossed and the I's aren't dotted from the federal standpoint in that uh, these sites don't have permits for uh, disposal uh, yeah. of waste materials. 
So th that's where we come into a real dilemma, right? So there are a couple of kind of data, data points. What we do know is um, tribal lands, which are largely west of the Mississippi, right? Um, really overlap and intersect against public lands. So public lands are about 600 million acres. If you include um, Alaska, um, native um, um, res lands are about 100 million acres. So we're really talking about one sixth of all public lands are um, within the domain of native communities. 85% of, um, of native lands are, hold our biodiversity. So you got this large swath of public lands, which is um, a large segment are native, 85% of diversity. And then as we go into this next iteration of the, you know, of a green economy, about 60 to 65% of rare elements are on native lands. And so what historically has been seen, and again, I, you know, I, I entered the conversation talking about some former jobs, but I've been, you know, the native advisor for um, entities that are by and large engaged in the permitting process. And what I've seen is we have a consultation policy. It requires input from tribes. It doesn't mean we have to do exactly what tribes say, but we have to do it in good faith. I will say this, what I have seen is 95 percent of the time it goes pretty well however when they want to do something whether it is a wind turbine or this next iteration of saying oh we need this because there's a national security interest then all of that shit goes to the side because um what they can claim is there are national security interests and we don't have to abide um by the terms of formal consultation and so that is when um, real issues of environmental justice really rise because it then becomes the worst kind of thing, a pedantic formality. Um, and the input of tribes, which should really be digested in a somber and earnest, earnest way, get be put on the wayside because we want to advance the next kind of, again, iteration of our green economy. And so it is, that is where we need to be really vigilant and have to speak out on behalf of these communities. <coughs> Excuse me. I wonder, I wonder if you've seen my film, Who Are My People? I have not, but I will check it out. I'll send it to you. I made a movie on the solar development and the Mojave Death <laughs> And I was uh, informed at that point that um, that there was a lot of misinformation, disinformation being uh, put out there by the um, by the applicant companies, and then uh, also by the BLM. And kind of as a newbie in this area, I was appalled. As a citizen, I would say, rather than a newbie, I'm a citizen of the United States. So I don't think that my government should be breaking laws and lying to the population in the name of extraction to benefit a few companies. So I was very surprised. And I really welcome your comments there because that's how I got into this. And then I started doing interviews at Packer Pass and I'm doing another one this week with Doris Sam. And it seems like because of the Mining Act and then what you mentioned about the national security incentives, although I haven't heard that specifically mentioned, uh, they seem to be proceeding that way and essentially ignoring um, the National Historic Preservation Act and, and other uh, federal laws that would put uh, a little bit of a break on some of this stuff in, on behalf of better judgment. Yeah, so uh, there are instances, um, and so just share, there's clarification here. There are two forms of kind of consultation. There is the consultation that is really derived from the federal trust responsibility, and it's the administrative duty to consult with tribes. The other one that you allude to is via the National Historic Preservation Act, and it's called a 106 consultation. It is actually, you can litigate against it for unsatisfactory consultation. However, there are entities, say within the Department of Defense, 
that can waive 106 responsibilities of a consultation um, because of national security interests. So um, it, it's not always on an equal playing field um, in, in which we interface um, with Indian country on these types of issues. And so um, one can see if, you know, there was the political willpower and you kind of frame it in the right way, you can bypass this. Um, I, and I'll give you, this is not Indian country, but it is a prime example. And the um, issue of um, on Hawaii Island, there are telescopes, what they call TMT, 30 meter telescopes. Um, and um, there were similar telescopes on Haleakala on Maui, where the tragedy, tragedies have just occurred in the last couple of weeks, um, although that's on the west side of the island. When they had to renew that on Haleakala, they had to do a 106 consultation. However, um, in a very similar fact pattern, the 30 meter telescopes on Hawaii Island said, oh, we don't have a federal nexus, thus there is no consultation. I actually wrote a memo for the organization I was with to say, I, I, I don't agree. I, I think there is a delineable federal nexus. They receive monies from the National Science Foundation. The overseeing entity is the University of Hawaii, who also receives federal dollars. Um, they went and back and forth. About six months ago, they said they're going to go back to do a, a consultation after denying this for about a decade. So my point is, at times, there is a overt avoidance to just do the right thing. But here's the thing. This 106 consultation, it culminates in what's called a programmatic agreement. It is basically a managerial management kind of plan on how we will um, operate and manage with the community. They could have mitigated all of this by just saying, let's do the 106 consultation. But they tried to avoid it, cost them both goodwill, public relations, probably tens of millions of dollars. Um, and they're right back where they, sh they should have been in the first place. And so uh, much of this, sometimes we get caught up in the political headwind um, that occurs from time to time behind these issues. And so some of it, um, you just have to unpack um, and, and you find out there's this other history or there's this other kind of impetus that is really kind of instructing um, where they're going with this. And so it, it is the common problem. And I think, um, especially, you know, for the tribes in Nevada, the Paiutes, um, with lithium, um, they're going through the same thing now um, because it, it's important to the government, right? They, they see this as a really valuable kind of commodity that they need to advance their interests. But like so many things, they're doing it on the backs of native people. And um, again, um, the US in many instances is very aligned when it's easy, but when it becomes difficult um, is when it takes on a different tenor, a different complexion, a different cadence. But these policies in my eyes mean nothing if they can't be invoked and implemented when it's really meaningful. Otherwise, it goes back to what I said, a pedantic formality. Right. Well, Thacker Pass is a good example because the first judge in the Ninth Circuit, uh, whose name is Miranda Du, said that, well, unfortunately, because of the lack of disposal of waste and the lack of permitting for such, it's illegal. But we're going to go ahead anyway. Now, down in Oak Flat in Arizona, uh, Biden put Oak Flat copper mining on pause because of the lack of a permit for the disposal of waste. So how would they justify the contradiction in a case like that? Yeah, and, and that's when, you know, it, it becomes problematic. Um, the, 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 and the problem too is if you look at what's been said through courts, the way that um, Native people advance their spiritual interests, you, you have to realize is, is that the Bears Ears is important, right? Because 
from a Western construct, what you want to do in a very surgical way is find the smallest area and say, this area is sacred. But in a holistic native way, um, think about it this way. If you were outside a synagogue, um, right, and you were in the parking lot, you want to throw a bunch of garbage in the parking lot, but then say the synagogue itself is pristine. It is the totality of experience from the parking lot to the stairway to the inner chambers of that synagogue that make it sacred. And so in the same way, it is the totality of landscape that really um, allows native people to worship. Um, but we want to, you know, pick the, the, this really micro dot and say, well, just tell me where the area that's sacred, when the reality is it's the largeness of the landscape that creates the sacredness. And that's why um, things like the Bears Ears and the Grand Canyon um, are what I call a force multiplier, right? You protect large swaths of land. Um, you allow traditional knowledge to be um, the managerial practice. You allow native people to have cultural and traditional ceremonies. Um, and you, at the same time, practice the highest level of environmental justice. Just in that, you know, one minute, I checked off like four or five huge boxes. And that's why we should work with native communities. By doing this, you give the land back and then you get this incredible additive for everyone. Um, and so for me, it becomes fairly simple when you think about it in such ways and terms. Well, um, I mentioned contradictions. There's a couple of other ones I should probably bring up. like. Sand Creek in Colorado is a monument, and it's a massacre site. And uh, so it has um, protections, and it's understood to be a total landscape. And uh, Thacker Pass apparently wasn't considered for such a thing. And then also, if you look at Gettysburg, you know, the part that's sacred isn't just where the soldier fell. They didn't just outline the body, you know, like you'd expect on a street with right. a with a police murder, you know, it's, it's, you have the entire experience. Like people go there and visit and they want to know where Robert E. Lee sat on his horse and surveyed the action. And they want to know where the troops came from, what route and where people uh, uh, fled to or retreated to, if that was the case. So with Gettysburg, we look at the total landscape. So what's in the way? I mean, do we just call it racism and say, well, you know, that's the way we are as a country? Well, it, it's certainly they're following an orthodoxy, right? Um, and, it, it's, and it's very similar. Um, you know, there are entities that um, fund sacred sites, um, but in their minds, it is a Protestant chapel in Western Massachusetts. It is not the landscape or a kind of Hopi altar in the Bears Ears. In fact, they don't even have monies for it. And so we've allowed ourselves not to be bamboozled, but to be very myopic in the things that we call sacred, um, because the spirituality has a Western construct to it. And so some of that is allowing a much more kind of, I don't want to say liberal, but expansive view of what these things mean. Um, so, you know, you know, one of the things, you know, I, I talked about recently is, you know, I, I'm not against per se uranium. I, I think we as a nation need to explore all things, but at one of the seventh wonders of the world, you know, we're, we're less than about a 1% of uranium extraction can be found. You want to put that in jeopardy for such a marginal kind of benefit? Come on now. I mean, <laughs> You know, that doesn't even make any sense at all. But if you were to listen to, you know, those people from the uranium companies, they're like, oh, this is incredibly important to us. And the fact is, they still have um, um, an outfit that is right out um, on the boundary of the new monument that they're still going to do. Is it going to resolve anything? 
Hardly. I mean, if you look um, and some of the things that, you know, conservative outlets, they said that um, Russia has a monopoly and we're, we're, we're allowing Russia to really run our energy policies. Russia has less than 5% of all uranium um, stockpiles in the world. Come on now, let's, you know, I mean, anyone can like look up this information and see what the reality is. Um, and so, you know, my thing is to always try to operate from a factual basis and then put things on the table and then have a kind of a healthy discourse about them. But let, let's not bamboozle ourselves with false numbers or inflammatory statements that are incredibly false and flaccid. Yeah, well, these are real people with families and dreams and, you know, ideas about life that they'd like to fulfill. And I'm thinking of White Mesa. This was said specifically about White Mesa, where there's a, a uranium mill. Like, literally, they're just over the fence, apparently. Yeah. <clears throat> they're a fence line community. And then that is, that's been chosen as a site for international disposal, from what I understand now. So. Yeah. There, they've, there, there has been some talk that, you know, that could create a revenue stream of taking things from like, ironically, from the Ukraine and then storing and transporting them. So how does this get elevated to the public and how does this get changed and can the public do it if they're if they're so informed or motivated? Uh, what would your recommendation be? Um, you know, like anything else, um, and I think this applies to many phases of life, um, become informed and become engaged. Um, you know, the Bears Ears was a very political issue, but, you know, during the public comment period for the Bears Ears, in which they received over 100,000 comments, um, over 90% were supportive. And in fact, within the state of Utah, where you think, oh, that's where the, you know, the hoof meets the road, it was above 80%. And so when people are engaged and fully informed, I do think um, it does take on its own life. It becomes spirited. Um, and that for all of us, um, the other thing I say is, you know, you don't have to be native to have a native sensibility to the land. When you think about the land as an extension of yourself, then you come into an intimacy by take caring of the land. I not only take care of myself, I take care of this woman, this child, the fella behind me. And it is the legacy that we can all give to each other. And so while it certainly derives from a native kind of conflation, that this is an extension, we can all live that. And I encourage people to explore that notion that land and water and even sentient objects are an extension of you. And by taking care of that, you are taking care of yourself. And by taking care of yourself, you will take care of your community and that community next to you. Thank you, Pat. That's a wonderful way to close. It's inspiring and motivating and it gives people a, a direction. And so thank you so much and blessings to you and I'll let you get on with your day. Thank you, Robert. You have a great day.